Hey everyone and welcome back to another Unreal Niagara tutorial. One really common use case for particles in games will be having something which will have a dynamic start and end point for use for things like projectile tracers or energy beams. And that's what we're going to be looking at creating today and we'll be recreating something similar to what I have showing in the background just here. Before we get started, just to let you know that this isn't intended to be a complete beginner's tutorial, so if you haven't used Niagara at all before and don't know what some of the different systems and components with the new Niagara system are, I'd recommend looking at my previous video, I'll leave a link in the description below, for creating a stylized fire particle, which will cover some of the basics like the difference between emitters and systems and when to use them. When you have that done though, you'll be ready to follow along in this step-by-step -step process to recreate this projectile tracer. So let's get started by going to a new folder. I'm gonna place this in my effects folder. And inside of here, we just want to right click, search for effects, and then go to Niagara emitter. For the beam particle we're gonna be making, there's already a really good template. So we're gonna go into the new emitter from a template, and then we're going to choose this dynamic beam particle. So this is going to give us by the end of this, a really convenient way to create a beam starting from one point and then going towards a dynamic end point. So choose that and select that as your base particle emitter. And I'm just going to rename this to N underscore projectile underscore EM. So just a few things ready to keep the project easy to uh, maintain. The first thing is I'm always going to just drag the timeline down to the length of the actual particle effect. That just means that we get a faster and um, easier to work with preview over here. So we don't get a lot of uh, kind of dead space where we're not seeing anything updating. Next, we can go through the particle itself. So unlike the flame particle, this is actually pretty close to what we want as the end result. But we're just going to go through the emitter and change the things we want specifically. So if we start with the emitter update, the very first thing is the loop behavior is set to infinite, which means this is going to keep replaying over and over. Now, whilst this is great for the preview, if you were to use this in the event of something like a gun being fired, it just means that uh, after the initial lifespan is over of the particle, it will then replay in the exact place you fired it. So you're going to get just projectiles replaying themselves over and over in the level. So we're going to change this from infinite to once. We only want this to happen that one time that you call it. And then everything else here is perfectly fine. So the one thing that we will focus on a little bit, though, because we'll be changing this later, is the beam emitter setup. So at the moment, this is what is controlling the end point. So the start point is the location of the particle itself. And then the end point is 200 units on the X away from that. So we can move this around and we can see we get a longer particle. Now we could do this manually, but what we want to do by the end of this video is to have this being updated by some user input in a blueprint. So for now, I'm just going to keep this at the 200 on the X, just so that we get a nice kind of compact preview going on over here. The burst amount is perfectly fine at 100. If you change this to anything higher, it doesn't really look any different. If you change it too low, then you won't see anything. So this is pretty much ideal. And then down in the particle spawn section, the next thing I want to change is the line width. So this is currently controlling the size of the particle over its life. You can see here it's starting off quite thick and then ending into a kind of tapered off tail of a particle. So because we're making a single beam, I want this to be pretty much uniform across which is the end result that I showed in the demonstration. So that's kind of what we're aiming for here. But just as an example of what this is doing, if we move this around, we can see based on this curve, we can increase and decrease the scale of the particle at different points in its life. So we could have something really, really chunky at the start and then much thinner at the end. So this could be quite a good stylized effect. Uh, but like I said, I just want that nice constant flat beam that I demonstrated at the beginning. So I'm just going to actually delete this middle point. I'm going to grab both of the other points that are here, right click on one of them and change this to a linear curve so that there's no change whatsoever. And then again, with both of these selected, I'm going to change the value to be something around, let's say 0.2. Okay, so this is our nice kind of flat beam that we'll be seeing when we spawn the particle in. Now, the only other thing that would have looked slightly different in my example is the color. So I'm going to go down to the color option, change this from blue to the kind of orangey yellow that I had in the display. And then there's just one more thing that I don't like about this, and that is the opacity which is being applied to the tail end of the particle system. Now, that's happening just because of the default ribbon material. You can see it's actually got the specific opacity fade over life on this material. So I'm going to fix this very easily by creating our own material and applying it to this particle. So if we go back into the folders, if you don't already have this, go ahead and create a materials folder and create a new material. Now I'm going to use the previous one I had, which is M underscore particle base, but this is really simple to recreate. 
So I've set this to be an additive blend mode and the shading model of unlit. So then just using a particle color and passing that into the emissive value. Now the one change I'm gonna make here is I'm also gonna drag off of this now and add a multiply node. I'm gonna plug in the result of our multiply into the emissive color now, and this will be based on a scalar parameter. So in the graph, I'm just going to hold S and left click, and that will give me a scalar parameter that I'll call emissive strength. I'm gonna set this to a default value of one and then just plug this into the B pin. If we apply and save this, we now have pretty much the same result at the moment, but in the material instance we're gonna create, this will allow us to affect how bright the emissive value is, and you'll see why in a moment. The other thing is we can see that this has no opacity whatsoever, which just makes it for the, the kind of effect that I was going for look a little bit more like I'd intended. So I already have a material instance here. I'm going to keep that one separate because that will be for the flame. Um, I don't want to add any emissive value to the flame from my previous example. So I'm going to right click and create a new material instance. I'll call this one M underscore particle projectile underscore inst. And then inside of this material, I know that I want this to be a much higher emissive strength. So I think something like 30 works quite well because it's only gonna be a very thin kind of line of particle on the screen anyway, so we can get away with a slightly higher emissive value. So finally, back in the emitter, we're just going to change the default ribbon to our projectile instance, and there we go. We can see we now have got a nice solid beam coming from one point to the other. So if those changes made, I'm just going to compile, apply, and set the thumbnail so we can now see what this is in our folder. I'm gonna right click on this and create a system from this. I'm just gonna rename this and remove the EM from the name. Inside of the Niagara system, of course, this is going to look pretty much exactly the same, or it does look exactly the same, apart from we have this node over here. Uh, one thing I wanted to change is that in the emitter, we also need to create our user exposed variable. So this is going to be the endpoint of the beam, which is going to be a vector three in the world, or the locations. And we add this by simply pressing the plus button here under user exposed. We'll look for the vector value, and it's just the standard vector. You can see here, what we want is the other one in 3D space. And I'll call this one beam end. So with our beam endpoint, we then also want to go over to the beam emitter setup. And remember, this is currently just kind of hard coding this 200 units away from the start point. So we want to use this drop down, and then in here we'll search for user. Now at the moment, because we only have one user created variable, which is our beam end, this is going to be the default option. So we can just select that. Now this will remove the preview because at the moment that's just a kind of empty vector. If it zeroes out, it's actually going to be the same point as the start point, so we're not seeing anything here. But that's fine. I'll show you a handy tip to kind of view and update this and also have the beam end set as our desired endpoint. But for now, we just need to compile and save this in the emitter. Make sure that this is also updated in the system, which we can see here that it has. So compile and save that. And then back over in the emitter, if we now undo this, we can still control the details here. So say we wanted to visualize something here, maybe we wanted to change the color, so we'll change this back to blue. That means we can do all of this visual editing in our emitter. The projectile system is still going to use the beam end, and this is going to be important in a moment. So if we now go and create a blueprint, I have a blueprint folder ready for this. I'm gonna create a new blueprint class of type actor, and I'll call this one BP underscore projectile test. Then inside of this blueprint, I'm just going to remove the uh, default scene route because this is going to get in the way in a moment. So I'm going to replace this with a scene component just so that we don't have this uh, visualization going on with the, uh, the small spherical object. Then in the event graph, I'm going to create a new timer based on a function name. So set timer by function name. I'm going to call that function spawn particle and we'll call this every four seconds. So the emitter currently lasts for about three seconds where it's visible. There's then one second where it kind of goes invisible. And then after that, we're going to spawn in another projectile just so we can see kind of quick and immediate updates and make some tests. We just want this to be looping. And then I'm just going to copy the, uh, the function name and create a new custom event and paste this in as the custom event name. And then one final thing just before implementing this, I'm just going to call this before the function because there's going to be a delay of four seconds before the initial function is called. So I'm going to call this straight away, set the timer, and then call it again in another four seconds. So spawn particle. And then down here, we want to spawn our Niagara system. So if you're not familiar with the, the new syntax, the node naming and stuff like that, just type the word Niagara. And we can see here we get all of the context sensitive and uh, specific to our search terms, uh, all of the nodes specific to that returned. 
Now the one that we want is the spawn system at location. So previously, if you're familiar with Cascade, that would have been spawn emitter at location. These are now called systems. So we're going to use that one instead. And then that's going to allow us to choose one of our systems that we've created. In this case, we want the projectile system. Okay, so the important values we have here are the location. This is going to be where the particle starts. So if you're using this as a projectile beam, you may start this at the end of a, a weapon barrel or something. For our demonstration, we're just going to get the actual location of the actor we're calling this from, like so. And then because we now have a reference to our projectile, we can use our return node and we can set a vector parameter. So the set vector parameter is going to take in a name, which of course you probably guessed will be our beam end, the one that we created in our Niagara system. And we can then fill this with a value, which is where we want the beam to end. So this is how we're getting our dynamic endpoint. So what I'm gonna do for this is I'm going to promote this to a variable. I'm gonna call this one beam end. And then the important things here is I'm going to make this a public variable and make sure that we show the 3D widget. Now what this will allow us to do is if we drag this into the world, and this is why I removed the scene component is otherwise it kind of obscures the, uh, the widget, but that vector widget has given us the option to move just that point around and we can see the beam end is updating as we do this. So this will now control where we're firing from, which will be the location of the blueprint over here, to the beam end vector. So in fact if we press simulate, we should see that happening perfect. So then that should disappear, and then in, yep, four seconds that will reappear. Now the great thing with this is, is we can update this. So if we grab our projectile, move the beam end, we can see that is now updating. So if this was a weapon, obviously you're looking around, you're gonna be doing a line trace, and the beam end would be the end of that line trace, whether it either hit a wall or has reached the kind of maximum distance you're looking to fire. So this is using the variable that we created. And then the next thing I said is that we're gonna look at changing this uh, dynamically. So let's say we wanted this to be blue, we're gonna compile and apply this. So we can see that that has taken in the blue color that we wanted. And then we're just going to want to update this with our user value. And you can see this is really handy because we can do all of this kind of during the simulation because everything can be made quite dynamic with the new Niagara system. So this is really cool, I think we can really play around with different stuff here. And like I said, having it this way, you've got the emitter where you can change the more visual aspects of things, uh, such as the color, the length, just so you can get a good idea of what you're creating and updating. And then you can use your main system to actually hold the values that you want, which is going to be our beam end. So I've just changed the color again. The beam end is still the main point this is traveling towards. So we've got the important functionality in the system, and then we can change the visuals in the emitter. So there you go, that is how we can use some user variables for dynamic points in a particle system. And you could use this to drive things like the end point of a particle also being the impact point and then spawning another emitter in the system of the impact effect based on where that ended and things like that. So this can be really useful and looks like again Niagara is going to be really good for just a lot more kind of quick and convenient development. So as always if you enjoyed the video or find it useful please do leave a like and share the video around that really helps and do consider subscribing to be kept up to date with any of the videos I create on a weekly basis covering a large range of game development topics. And of course, remember to hit the notification bell to actually get those updates if you're looking for those. As ever though, thanks for watching and I will see you all next time.